Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. In Psalms 1 and Psalms 73. They're dealing with the traditional concept of Old Testament theology about the temporal order and judgment of our world. To the Old Testament Jew, if God loved you and you were living a righteous life, you were physically blessed and prospered. If you were a wicked person, then you should be cursed and have physical problems and, and financial problems and the rest. But it became obvious to the Old Testament people that sometimes the wicked do prosper and the good do suffer. The book of Job is a reaction against this, and the Psalm 73 particularly reacts against this. And Psalm 1 sets the stage for this question by talking about the two ways. Now, the two ways are more an aspect of wisdom literature, especially the Proverbs, which Psalm 1 reflects. There is those who live for God, and there is those who do not live for God. And there's no middle ground in this literature. Psalms 1 is really an introduction to the entire Psalter. Uh, the first book of the Psalter, Psalm 1 through 42, every psalm has an introduction except 1 and 2. And so as we uh, open our Bibles to Psalm 1, I hope you'll follow with me. I think there are very interesting things here that are really going to set the stage for Psalm 73. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, the word blessed here is similar to the word happy is. Uh, the Greek word, of course, uh, that uh, corresponds to this Hebrew word is what Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, where he says, blessed are those. And so it's the idea of happiness or prosperity too. Now when it says, who does not walk, and notice in the next little line it says, nor stand in the path of sinners. The word walk and the word way are metaphors of the Bible to describe a person's lifestyle. Uh, many times a walk uh, speaks of a person's life. And of course the word way is the earliest designation of the New Testament Christians. They were called the way, which signified it was not a mental thing that they did. It was not simply a volitional thing they did. It was a lifestyle commitment they'd entered into. That's why the Christians were called the way. When Jesus calls himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, the Old Testament reflects well-worn wagon paths or foot paths that God would have us walk in. The implication is the law or the Torah gives us guidelines for life. The righteous walk within those guidelines. The wicked go outside those guidelines. Now, what mentions here the word wicked, often when we think of the word wicked, we think of murderers and adulterers and embezzlers and uh, horrendous kind of people. But that's not the idea here. It's uh, Mr. Good Citizen who seems to be a real nice person, a good community person, and yet he's living apart from God's law. He's living as unto himself, and that's the idea of wicked here. Notice what it mentions in the, um, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now the word delight, you might want to see Psalms 19, 7 through 10. It has often been said that the law was a burden to Jews, and we get that from Paul's writing. The law was a burden as far as a path or a means to righteousness, but it was not a burden as far as God's revealing himself and his truth to man. Matter of fact, Psalms 19 says it's sweeter than a honeycomb. It's more precious than gold. The Jews loved the law of God. They, uh, they reveled in it. Uh, now, notice what it says, the law, that's the word Torah. It usually refers to the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. But in the Psalms, it refers to all the teachings of God, a more general sense of revelation in general. Now, when it mentions here, and in his law he meditates day and night. This Psalm is going to be uh, particularly interested in the food of a man's thought life. To the Jews, what a man let in his mind became what a man was in action. You might uh, remember the verse, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Uh, I think it's Proverbs 23, 7. That is the idea here. If we meditate on God's law day and night, means all the time, then we're going to be putting into our life things that are going to, going to breed happiness and peace and stability. If we allow the things of the world, our competitiveness, our comparisons, our criticisms, uh, it's going to issue in our lifestyle action. 
Now, um, when it says, He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water. Now we'll see Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8 for a parallel here. Trees were a very special thing to the Hebrew or uh, nomadic or desert people. Trees became sacred spots, oasis, because they revealed underground water sources. A tree oftentimes in the Bible is a symbol of a man's life or destiny. Now here's the idea of planted, implication being by God, by streams of water. Now this is not so much uh, a river, because you know many times a river floods and streams and trees are washed away on the banks. This is the idea of a king's garden, a tree, a fruit tree, planted by a man-made canal where water is provided all year. Notice it says, which yields its fruit in its season. Uh, this is the biblical idea that fruit is the analogy of a mature life. I remember in the Gospels where it talks about the parable of the sowers or the soils, where four kinds of uh, soils receive the, the seed of the Word of God. Only one of those soils uh, grew uh, the seed to fruition. Fruition is the biblical concept of salvation or maturity, that kind of idea. Um, where it says its leaf does not wither, this is not saying it doesn't have seasonal changes. It's saying it's not influenced by drought or times of adversity. Uh, all of us as believers have times of adversity, but the beauty of it is that God gives us stability and a peace in the midst of those circumstances, and therefore our lives are not the roller coaster that simply conforms to what it's going through. Now, then it mentions the idea, but the wicked are not so. Uh, they are like shaft which the wind drives away. Notice he's comparing that the righteous prosper and the wicked uh, do not prosper. Well, this just wasn't really true as far as life. It was a good theology as far as ideals, but it just didn't, uh, where the rubber hit the road, it wouldn't work. Now, the idea of wind here, of course, is the idea of the mechanism of God that's going to drive the shaft away later on. Uh, that's the idea of a threshing floor, as you know, the, the ancient... Uh, uh, threshed by walking animals over their, their grain crops. And once the animal's hooves had loosened the grain from the, the container or the shaft or the sheath, then they threw it up in the air and the wind blew the light things away. In the Bible, the word vanity is a word that means light or nothing. That which has no root is blown away. And that's the implication of the wicked. Now it says, therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment. The idea of judgment, I think, probably is best compared with 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15, about that a man builds on a foundation. He may build with wood, hay, and stubble, or he may build with gold and precious stones and that kind of thing. The fire of judgment is going to reveal each man's work, and that's the idea here. Now, it says, The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word know in the Bible is a uh, a word that speaks of strong, intimate, interpersonal relationships. Adam knew Eve, and she conceived. The Lord uh, knows his own. My sheep know my voice. It's used of those intimate relationships between God and man. When it mentions that the wicked will perish, in the Old Testament, of course, we're talking about uh, temporal disasters and problems. Uh, but the, the concept is found also in the New Testament, especially like John 3.16, where it speaks of eternal perishing or adds that implication of eternal separation from God that the Old Testament frequently does not, not see. It speaks of this life only, usually. Now, before I uh, get on to Psalm 73 that intensifies this argument, here's our announcer with some further Bible study opportunities for you. Thank you for watching today. Bob will return in just a moment. We at the International Sunday School Lesson would like to take this opportunity to offer you a weekly exegetical outline of these Sunday School Lessons free. This includes historical background, word and phrase study, and discussion questions. All we need is your address. Now, here is ours. International Sunday School Lesson Incorporated, Post Office Box 2711, Lubbock, Texas, 79408. Also, there is available free and postage paid the catalog of Bob's teachings on cassette tapes. This catalog includes over 900 subjects. We will be happy to send it to you this week so that you can order the tapes that interest you. Now here is our address again. International Sunday School Lesson Incorporated, Post Office Box 2711, Lubbock, Texas 79408. 
Thank you. Now let's go to Psalm 73. I've entitled in my Bible, From Doubt to Certainty. It's really a struggle with the unfairness of our world. I want to tell you, it took me a long time to realize this world is not fair. And God is not fair either if there's not an afterlife. If God is all-knowing and, and all-good and all-powerful, this world is messed up. Now, either he's going to set it straight in the next life, or, or existence is unfair. And that began to, to uh, really uh, cause some change in Old Testament ways of understanding. And this psalm is crucial. Surely God is good to Israel. Now, well, before, let me go back a minute. The psalm of Asaph. Asaph is one of the leaders of the temple choirs. You find it in 1 Chronicles 25, 1 through 9. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Now, this idea of pure in heart, again, uh, parallels the Sermon on the Mount thing about Matthew 5, 8. Speaks of the purity and sincerity of attitudes. Never was everybody in Israel right with God. Only those who had the proper attitude and the proper personal relationship. Many people who were Jews by national lineage and by birth were not uh, spiritually related to God. Now, but as for me, my feet came close to stumbling and my steps had almost slipped. Now, I want you to notice again another biblical metaphor that uh, is often used is the idea of stumbling or slipping. Again, man's life is characterized by a walk a walk in a straight path. So therefore, slipping or stumbling or missing the path is the Hebrew way of talking about sinning or rebellion. So the slip or stumble is a way of talking about a lifestyle that's not pleasing to God. Notice what it mentions, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. This man is taking the sharp, narrow look at life, and we're so prone to do that. He's looking at his friends who are openly rebellious against God, openly didn't care anything about the Bible, and they're, they're going great guns. Their health is there. They're prospering. They seem to be outwardly happy. And here he, he is struggling with trying to be what God wants him to be, and his life is miserable at the moment. So he begins to say, hey, what's the deal? Uh, 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 why is this happening to me? I've done the best I can to be good, and I'm still not doing all that I want to be. Now, here's this idea of how works get so caught up in the faith. I think a beautiful passage in relationships to works and blessing is found in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. I think good works are a natural result of meeting Jesus Christ, but they are not the grounds for us meeting Jesus Christ, and they are not the grounds for blessing. God does not bless us because we deserve it. He blesses us because who he is, not who, who we are. And that was the confusion here. Now, notice it mentioned verse 4. For there are no pains in their death. Now, really, grammatically, this could be for them instead of in their death. And then it says, they, nor are they plagued like mankind. The word plague is often used for the judgment of God. And what this guy is saying is, God, you haven't done what you said you'd do. Now, here's a few verses. Genesis 12:17, 1 Kings 15:5, Isaiah 26:5, and Job 1:11 and Job 2:5. So God was supposed to act in these people's lives. The author is not doubting the uh, presence of God or the power of God. He's wondering why God is not acting. Now, that's the problem. Notice what it mentions here. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and a garment of violence covers them. This is the idea of clothing. It's often used in the Bible to represent, again, our lifestyle. When Paul talks about taking off the old man and putting on the new, it's this, it's this uh, metaphor of clothing as a garment. This necklace was a very prominent piece of jewelry. Everybody could see it. The wicked wore pride as a necklace, and yet God had not done anything, apparently. Now, notice where it mentions, their eyes bulge with fatness, their imagination, their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppressions. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue parades in the earth. They have been arrogant toward God. They have spoke against God. Uh, they're living in luxurious uh, fatness, uh, but they're oppressing people, they're, they're getting it from wicked ways. And the author is saying, look, they're talking about you, they're hurting your people, they're arrogant, they're prideful. God, why don't you do something? But God is seemingly not acting. And that's the, that's the theological problem. Well, in verse, verse 10 it says, therefore these people return to their place, and the waters of abundance are drunk by them. He's saying they just keep getting richer and richer. More prosperous, more prosperous. More luxury, more luxury. Look at verse 11. Then they say, how does God know? 
and is their knowledge with the Most High? Now here these wicked people are saying, man, look, look, look at my life. I don't serve God. I don't worship God. Uh, they're living in, as agnostics. They're saying, well, there must not be a God. He's not acting like he said he would. Therefore, I'll just live my life the way I want to, and I guess God can't do anything about it, or he doesn't know about it. Now, really, this is the philosophy of most people in America in our day. We don't have a whole lot of philosophical atheists, but I want to tell you, we have a whole lot of practical atheists. They live their life as if there were no God. Now, they may not say it with their mouth, but boy, with their lifestyle, they're saying God doesn't know, or he doesn't care, or he can't do anything about it. Well, we'll see what happens then. Notice what mentioned in verse 12. Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease, and they have increased in wealth. Now, really, this author, you know, he has little mixed motives here. He's saying, have I, I've been good, it doesn't make any difference to me. I've tried to be clean and pure-minded, and it hadn't helped me any. Now, this guy's got some uh, what's-in-it-for-me motives. Now, I want to tell you, I've heard folks all my life say, God can't use a dirty vessel. That's all he's got. That's all he's got. Or I've heard folks say, well... Uh, you need to have a pure motive. I've never had a pure motive about anything. My motives are always mixed, and this guy's mixed motives are showing quite readily here. What I try to do is have God's motive priority, though many other of my sinful human motives are clamoring for ascendancy. I still have them, but I still want God's motive priority. Now, let's continue then. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure and washed my hands innocent. He's saying, what good does it do to live a good life? Why am I being righteous? Why am I denying myself? You know this deal about, if this world is all there is, then I want to get my share of it. You know, this deal about, uh, you only go around once in life, let's get all the gusto we can. Now, if we only go around once, that's a true philosophy. I want my share of the pie. But if that's a false philosophy, if there is an afterlife, if there is a judgment, if there is a personal God, then that kind of philosophy is going to wreak havoc. And so the thought is saying, what do I get out of it? I've been good, and I'm still getting it in the neck, you know. Well, uh, are we serving God for what we get out of him? Isn't that what the devil said to Job? Job only serves you because of what he gets. God said, that's not true. But that's, that's the way men think about it often. Now, let's verse 14. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. He said, man, I, I just haven't been prosperous. Look at verse 15. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I should have betrayed the generation of thy children. The psalmist is saying, look, I, I wanted to openly ask some questions. I didn't think this thing was fair. I, I was willing to talk about it, but I was afraid that my influence would affect other people. I want to tell you, this is Romans 14 in an Old Testament sense. He was saying, because of other people's faith, I kept quiet. I kept this in. I struggled in my own heart with it. But I was afraid to talk about it because I just didn't think it really fit truth, and I didn't want my unbelief to affect somebody else. Pretty good. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. He tried to figure it out, and he just couldn't do it. So what did he do? Until I came to the sanctuary of God, then I perceived therein. When he came to worship, when he came to, came to close to God, he began to see, hey, I'm looking at this thing in the wrong way. So often the problems we have with God are from our perspective, not from universal truth or reality. He was looking at the short run. He was looking at the small picture. He was look, looking with tunnel vision. And now when he began to see God, begin to see God's overarching purpose, begin to take the long look, he said, you know, those guys are in trouble. I think it's so, so unfortunate when we just look at our life and our time. You know, it's possible for man individually to thwart the will of God in his life, but it is impossible for man to thwart the big picture or the, the long look. The more we see that we're going to reap what we sow, either in this life or the next, the more life begins to balance out, the more understanding and faith return to doubt and insecurity. Um, notice what it says, Then I perceive their end. His eyes of faith were open. He received the revelation from God, and the revelation said, Trust me, I'll work it out in the end. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man or a nation or a society sows, that shall they reap, Galatians 6, 7. It's going, they're going to get it. It's going to come back to them. Now, beginning in verse 18, then, 
Surely thou hast set them in slippery places. Again, there's that metaphor of slipperiness is over against stability. Thou hast cast them down to destruction, ruin. In this life they're going to have problems as well as in the next. How, how are they destroyed in a moment? They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when aroused, thou wilt despise their image or form. It's the idea that judgment is coming. Now this is what, this is what theologically had to happen. This world is not the world that God intended it to be. It's a world that's been affected by man's rebellion. And the way that God has chosen to deal with man's rebellion is not the iron hand of a despot, but the loving hand of a suffering servant. He is letting man do, go in his own course. He is letting the world without God develop itself and plan its own philosophies and, and make its own money. But out of that world, he's calling people to himself by faith. There will be a judgment day. You will stand before God, Christian and non-Christian. That's the idea here. Uh, you might want to think about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, it seemed in life that things were very unfair. But in the end, boy, the tables were really turned. Now, verse 21. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within. Now, the word... Uh, pierced within is the word for kidneys. It's the idea of the seat of the emotion to the Hebrew intellect. He's not saying this thing didn't really hurt him. He's saying there's many a sleepless night. I got really bitter about it. I, I got discouraged about it. I was angry with God about it when I saw the unfairness of life. Uh, it, it, it hurt my emotions. I was deeply moved by unfairness and sin and suffering and evil and disease and all of that. So it's not an easy task to come to this. But then I was senseless and, and ignorant. I was like a beast before thee. What, what he means by that is I had no understanding. I really didn't see what was happening. I just looked at my own life and my own little grasp, you know. Now, in verse 23 and 24, he lists three blessings that God gives that he recognized after he had come to collective worship to the sanctuary. Number one, I am continually with thee. The greatest blessing God gives is not the supernatural changing of circumstances, but his presence with us. There are still valleys of deep darkness, but God walks through the valleys with us. Now, here's the blessing. Notice it says, Thou hast taken hold of my right hand. God is guiding us. Notice the 23rd Psalm is a beautiful picture of that, you know. Leads me, guides me. The picture is that God is with us. At every moment, through thick or thin, through dark or light, he is there. He is holding, holding our hand. He is guiding our path. We are never alone. We are not forging our own destiny. We're not captains of our own ship. God is in control and active in our daily lives. What a, what a tremendous insight and blessing to realize. And afterward, receive me to glory. Now, this is a rare view in the Old Testament of the afterlife. We're going to see it a little bit later on, too. The sixth verse of Psalms 23, I'll live in thy house forever, is a dim view of the afterlife. Now, there's not much in the Old Testament about the fullness of the resurrection and the fullness of, of the New Testament as far as eternal security and mansions prepared for us. But there is the hope. Uh, many of the Psalms have it. The book of Job has it. The book of Daniel has it. Um, it's the idea, I don't know what's going to happen, but God will take care of it. It's the idea that I, I can't see clearly, but I do know God personally, and I trust him in those areas I can't see clearly. And that's the idea here. He received me. God accepts us the way we are. Even our doubt and unbelief is not something to alienate us from God. This man really had some problems, some doubts. Many of the prophets spoke almost blasphemous toward God in their doubts and anger. God is not mad, as a parent is not mad, when his children ask questions and when his children get angry. He's working with those kids to build something into their life for the long run. And God accepts us with our flaws and our anger and our doubts. Verse 25 and following. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Here is the emphasis on personal relationship. So often our prayers are filled with gimme, gimme, gimme. We picture God as a gigantic sugar daddy or someone we pull his string and he has to give us. I see the essence of the Christian faith symbolize something in prayer, 
The greatest thing about prayer is that we bend with God, not that we get what we ask for. What we need more than anything is God himself. We can, Augustine said we have a God-shaped hole in our life. We can try to put God's blessings, and we can try to put prosperity, and we can try to put physical pleasure, and we can try to put riches. We can try to put everything in our lives, but until we have God, we will not have peace and joy. But with God, with the absence of everything else, we'll have victory and peace. Boy, we need to see that. And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. There's the parallel to it. Notice, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength. That's the word for rock. It speaks of stability uh, of my heart and my portion forever. This goes back to Numbers 18.20, where the Levites did not receive an allotment of the land. They did receive. It says that God is their portion. Later on, in some parts of the Psalms, it says that God is our portion forever. It's picked up in the book of Hebrews, the New Testament. It's the idea that moves from the Levites to all of God's people. God is our inheritance. What we need more than anything is Him, not any portion of land or any kind of which riches. We need Him. Emphasis on personal relationship. Behold, for behold, those who are far from thee will perish. Thou hast destroyed all those who are unfaithful to thee. The word unfaithful is the word to go a whoring after. In the Old Testament, this uh, deal of personal relationship or the intimacy of God with his people is ascribed in family terms, God as husband, God as parent, God as close kin. Now when we go after other gods or we leave God, the Bible speaks that of going or whoring after other gods because of this metaphor of husband-wife relationship. It's in the New Testament. The church is the bride of Christ. It speaks of that intimate relationship and to break that, that commitment, to break those vows is unfaithfulness. That's what the word means here. Verse 28, But as for me, the nearness of God is my good, his presence. All right? I have made the Lord God my refuge, my strong tower, my defense, Okay, that I may tell of all thy works. Now here is very important. He struggles with doubt, but he comes to faith. And the, the result of faith is I've got to share what God means to me and what he's done in my life. I want to tell you that it is true there is a spiritual gift of evangelism, and not all of us have it. But it is equally true that it is every believer's responsibility to share with others the reason for the hope they have in themselves. Every Christian needs to be a witness. Every Christian needs to share of what God has done for their life. Friends, we need to be a community of sharing people of who God is and what he has done. We've had doubts, but now we have faith. God is a God that acts. He is a God that does something, and we can share that with others. Well, I've enjoyed being with you. I hope to see you again, same time.